and landscapes. Um, I never really got into landscapes so much. I do them on occasion. Uh, I just was reluctant to become a landscape painter. And <clears throat> I'm starting to change my mind now. I, I've taught landscape painting for the first time and I really enjoyed it. It's just I felt like there's just so many landscape painters and I didn't want to just fall into that sort of identity of all along with all the other <clears throat> artists who are jumping on the bandwagon because of the popularity of California landscape painting you know, from the early California landscape painting and everything. So I wanted to paint differently and so I, I really paint more, uh, I try to paint differently. It's, it's more tonal, it's not as uh, impressionist or bright colored and I try to paint things more at dusk and dawn. I just think it conveys stronger emotion. Uh, these, this one was plein air, yeah. Um, what it is is, if this painting looks bright and colorful, but by the way, I, I don't use any, any blue or green in my palette. The bluest I get is with black and white. So the blue achieved on the sky, and that's very accurate, is achieved with the black and a white, or if I add a little bit of um, terra rosa to make it more purple. Um, I just stack my palette with the warm colors, like, you know, cad orange and all the, all the earth tones, but then when it goes to the cool colors, it just abruptly just stops and goes straight to black and white. Now that keeps the palette much more closer in value. If I were to use ultramarine blue, for instance, I think that would be too acidy and too strong of a blue. So you don't use blue or green, but do you use purple? I don't use purple, no. Uh, to mix a purple, I mix, I use, I substitute black for blue. So if I need to uh, paint a purple, like you see in, in the shadow areas, you use black, white, and you add a little bit of a warm color, whether it's burnt sienna or, or, or some kind of warm color to make your purple. Is that, is that something you devised for yourself? Well, what, what happened was, it's, 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 it's taken from the past. Anders Zorn had a palette where he painted with black, white, uh, cad, cad red or vermilion, and yellow ochre, four colors, or really you could say two colors if you don't count black and white. And that's the palette I started using, and basically I just extended that palette to all the earth colors, you know, like I just let my, all my earth colors enter the palette, but I left off all the blues. There's, you know, there's no, no blues and no, um, no green, no viridian. So if I mix a green, I'll mix it with, um, yellow ochre and black, because green is a very diff dangerous color, so using yellow ochre and black is a more tamer color. If I need to go more intense with the green, I just add a little bit of uh, cad yellow. But frankly, since I started teaching landscape painting uh, in San Francisco, I did actually add the color uh, ultramarine blue, and I'll, I'll add a green. I, I'll try not to use it, but when you go out there in the bright sunlight, it's there and you can't avoid it. Oh, really? So what are the two, the blue and the green, would add? Well, it, it doesn't really matter to me. I mean, I mean, it doesn't matter to me. I mean, I use ultramarine blue, but, or a cobalt blue, you know. It, I don't think it's all that important. Um, I don't, I still don't use Viridian, but I do add, I have like a, I'll just buy one of those sort of pastel, what is it, um, Cinemar green, which is sort of an olive green. But I, I rarely use them. I think that's Colleen talking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I rarely use those colors, but sometimes you need to use them. If, you know, if I need to use it, I'll, I'll use it. Um, this was um, out in Toro Park in Salinas. You saw this original, if you can kind of tell, the areas in light are really heavy pot impasto, laid with a palette knife and I'll lay a soft brush over it. Um, and then it's in such in contrast where you can see the rock of the uh, thin, the transparency of the canvas and dripping paint. So uh, I think that adds a lot of interest to the, the paint quality, I think adds a lot of interest to a painting. Do you do it from life? Pardon me? Do you do it from life? Uh, about half my landscapes are from life. And I, lately I've been painting a lot, almost all my landscapes from life. Um, and I found, uh, because I started teaching it. <laughs> and I started taking the students out and um, it's, it, it's not so difficult to like, you don't have to paint it in one day. You, you, I'd say you have a good four or five hours of painting, during, believe it or not. Even though the light changes, you still have, I think, a good four or five hours, maybe four hours of painting time. And, because uh, it'll change, but you can sort of deal with that. It's the same way you're dealing with a live model where the 
where the drapery changes every time the model sits on the stand or the hand position changes. You figure out ways to deal with it. And I did the same thing with landscape painting. You figure out ways to deal with the changing light. And I find that it's not so difficult. In fact, it's very easy just to come back the next day or a week later and resume painting. I was sort of running out of ideas, at least I thought, I perceived I was running out of ideas. And I thought, I'm painting field workers and I'm painting these gra biographical interiors. I got to paint something different. And so for a while, I thought of painting other artists at work. And I, there's a Carmel Art Festival where all the plein air painters come here. And I started driving around, trying to hunt them down and photographing them. And so um, these are some of the paintings from that series of these landscape painters at work. The most interesting to me was the one I brought here, was this older man. Um, in fact, some of you may recognize him. Perry's a well-known artist here in Pacific Grove. Uh, I forgot his name, but uh, Steve Hawk at the Hawk Gallery recognized him right off the bat. Um, he wasn't part of the, the Plain Air Series event, but he was, I came and was photographing him. And, uh, you know, I thought he didn't never knew I was there. I left, I came and I left, and he never knew I did the painting, never knew I was there, but I thought he was the most interesting person to paint. Was that Joe Norton? Exactly. Joe Norton. Joe Norton, that's right. Yeah. That's the name. Thanks. And of course, the painting on the easel is not Joe's. That his style was quite more colorful, but I had him doing an underpainting the way I paint. <laughs> <laughs> Doing it the right way. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> the landscapes, that's right, the landscapes are pretty small. Um, I, I'll try to remember to, t to mention the size. This is 18 by 24. Of course, you know that by looking at the original. By the way, um, after doing these series of artists at work, you know, I read this, art, this quote by Michael Kimmelman. Um, he's a New York Times art critic, very influential. I heard he can make or break an artist in New York or worldwide. And he, there was a quote he's, he's attributed as saying, as he said, um, most artists have one good idea, sometimes two, but in the best of cases, that's enough for a lifetime. And when I read that, it really settled me down and, you know, I, I didn't feel like I had to paint other subjects. I found my subjects, and I can continue exploring them. Um, you know, I think that's. A, I think it's really true if you look at a lot of historical artists. Um, you know, like Degas is well known for primarily painting those ballerina paintings. Um, you know, Monet with his haystacks and so forth. They painted other things, but there was always something they really kind of narrowed, or focused in on. I think Rembrandt is a good example. He painted a lot of different subjects, historical subjects, biblical subjects, but I think it was really his, um, his self-portraits that defined him. I, I think he would, you know, I, it's arguable, but I feel like many consider him to be the greatest painter who ever lived. Um, I think that he, uh, had he not painted those self-portraits, I don't know whether he would have just been another one of those great Dutch masters. Uh, he really captured all humanity in his own self-portrait, I think in portraits of himself, that, that's up to debate. Um, OK, we're coming to a closer end of the slideshow. My field worker paintings. And I wanted to show you the historical significance behind the field worker paintings. Um, the earliest field worker painter I could think of was Bruegel. Uh, and this is Peter Bruegel, uh, 17th century or 16th century, I believe. Was I 16th or 17th? 16th. Um, there's not a lot known about him, but one of the interesting things I did read about him was that he, he was anything but a peasant. He was, you know, an intellectual whose friends were scholars and writers, and his paintings never sold to the working class. It only sold to the uh, upper class, who, so they were never seen by the peasants themselves. And I, I just found that to be interesting. Historically, that's always been the case. Um, it's the uh, intellectuals and the upper class that are interested in buying paintings of social realism. And it's the, uh, the working class that are interested in buying portraits of queens and, and movie stars. And it's kind of a ironic. Uh, then probably the most important uh, field worker is Millet, of course. 
Francois Millet. I think he's the best because you know, even though his paintings weren't technically that good, I mean, when I say technically, I mean, you know, academically, I mean, in the 19th century, his work was considered crude. I mean, the style of painting was, you know, heavy handed and crude, but it's so powerful, you know, it's so, it's so emotional, and he really gets to the core of these people, I think. Um, in contrast to Jules Breton. This is uh, Jules Breton, who was a contemporary of Millet. He loved Millet's work, absolutely loved it, but his work was much more uh, idealized. Um, in fact, in Millet once quote, uh, quipped about Breton's work that Breton's women would never stay in the village very long, and which, I, which meant that his women were too pretty. And, um, but there's this interesting footnote is uh, Jules Breton was the favorite artist of Vincent van Gogh. Uh, another well-known French peasant painter was Bastien Lepage. Uh, he was very well known. He died very young at the age of 35. Uh, I think around 35, don't quote me on that. But he, uh, he, was, he had an incredible following, incredible following and he just like a, he would be much more well-known today if it weren't for, uh, upon his death, he was pretty much forgotten uh, and the start of use of photography in the 19th century. And there was one artist, English art critic and artist, uh, which is Walter Sickert. I don't know if you've heard of him. But he really, le really attacked uh, Bastien Lepage's work, you know, basically saying, you know, his work was worthy because he worked from photogra photography and because he worked from photography, he didn't have the essence, or et cetera, et cetera. The same things that people are saying today. And as a result, his work was plummeted in, you know, uh, in terms of its prices and interest in his work. Uh, the ir irony is that Walter Sickert used photography himself, but although his work was very much more abstract, he was also accused of being, recently accused of being Jack the Ripper, uh, Walter Sickert. <laughs> there was a well, that's how I feel. I mean, uh, that. Well, well, the thing is, is Millet did, and that's why his work looked cruder. Millet worked mainly from his imagination. He didn't have the. He really wished he could work from life. He wished that he could have, the, but he didn't have the money to afford the models. So he worked mainly from his imagination. So he would do poses like this, but they're much more cruder. But to get this kind of realism, you're right. I mean, that's how I feel too. I, I can't. Yeah, and it's a great painting. I mean, I, I don't think it looks like a photograph. If you see the originals, these are, these are great paintings. Uh, moving on to American painters. This is Eastman Johnson. I showed you his painting earlier. He also painted field workers, or cranberry harvest, I believe. Uh, Winslow Homer, cotton, he painted uh, cotton field workers. Um, and I guess I don't have a slide of Thomas Hart Benton. I think that carries it a little closer to the contemporary. Uh, and then we move on to, uh, oh yeah, move on to back over to Millet, the Gleaners, and I use this as reminiscent of my own painting, uh, which I called Rancheros. When I first came back to California from New York, I was searching for a subject. I, I grew up here in Monterey, and I had a teacher, a, a class called Steinbeck Country when I was 14 years old. And I read all these books by John Steinbeck. And that really was very profound to me, something about the whole feeling that I got from those novels. And so when I was moving back here, it was in the back of my mind, and I wanted to paint the field workers. Um, they, and I couldn't paint, like, I was in Petaluma, I couldn't paint the, you know, the vineyard workers. I had to paint the field workers from Monterey. That's all I could, wanted to paint. And uh, The other thing was the fact that, you know, this historical precedent that it tied back to the great painters that I admired from the past, but so that was more of an excuse to paint the subject. But you know, as I've painted it and talked to other people, you know, I've started to define what it is I'm painting more. Um, these field worker paintings. Uh, this was a model who, who modeled for me. And what it is is to me is it's it's a lot of people are, uh, you know, interpreting it in different ways. Maybe they see it as they see some political statement being made. I know I brought my paintings into, my field workers into a gallery in San Francisco that was representing me and they absolutely hated it. In fact, they, they got downright ugly about it. And uh, that was, you know, it, it was bad then, but it's good now. And, and I think in the long run, I think it was a good thing that I, but most of all, I think I get very positive reactions to these paintings. Um, 
interesting story uh, that I have to tell, especially with this painting here, is I had a student from UCSMB come visit my studio about a month ago. His name was Sergio Pena. Sergio, are you here? He said he was coming. Sergio Pena, from, he came and he, he didn't know who I was, but he wanted to do an essay on agricultural artists in Monterey County. And somehow he discovered me and he just loved my work. In fact, this particular paint, his father was a foreman. I don't, I don't remember the exact title, but out there. And he recognized those are his father's chairs. That's his father's machine. He just rec he grew up as a child looking at this stuff. And he just was so ex just moved by these paintings. But he called me up and he said, you know, I'm doing two artists. I'm essaying two artists. The other artist I'm doing is John Cerny. And I started laughing when he told me that. I said, you know, that is so funny because you can't be, you're doing a, such a contrast in, uh, it's such a contrast of artists in John Cerny who does these large cutouts, I'm sure you might, some of you might be familiar, cut arts of field workers and farmers out on the highways and the fields. And they're depicted with large smiles on their faces and they're wearing clean clothes like straight out of brand new out of Gap. And um, although I do think they're wonderful paintings and everything, I think it's such a contrast. I mean, his paintings are all, and my paintings are really about the field workers as they really are. I really feel like I'm painting them, I'm painting with an understanding of their plight. And in, in a sense, essence, I really feel the field worker is a tragic figure. And at least that's how I, I see it. And um, at least that's the side that I, interests me. And, um, and yet at the same time, I don't feel like the field, it's, I'm painting the field worker specifically. To me, they're a metaphor for the human condition. I mean, as a, a more universal aspect of, uh, than just the actual field workers themselves. It's, it's, it's a metaphor for life. And um, it, for me, the most powerful things in art are, are things of tragedy, uh, things that are not exactly happy. I don't, I don't think you have to go extreme like Goya and have be horrific or be depressing. And I don't, but I think that all great art, really, the greatest art is really steeped in some sense of tragedy. I think it reaches a little deeper in the human psyche. And I think that proves itself in almost all aspects of art. If you look at writing, Shakespeare, he wrote mainly about tragedies. In fact, when he was forced to write something happy, he called it As You Like It. Uh, in filmmaking, I think it's the same thing. Uh, um, all the filmmakers that I enjoy are really, really tap into things that are more tragic. Um, one f interesting example to me is Steven Spielberg, who paints, who, uh, paints, who directs movies of all these happy subjects of E.T. and it's Indiana Jones, but he doesn't win his ask Oscar until he does um, uh, Schindler's List, yeah. So, and there's, I could go on and on about that, but I do, I do, I'm a, I'm a fan of films as well, and I kind of make a correlation. There, there's a lot of the similar similarities in terms of um, composition and cinemato cinematography, composing things, light and shadow. The chairs. Pardon me? The chairs. Uh, the legs are cut off. The, 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 legs, the legs are cut off. Yeah. yeah I, you know, initially, I, actually, I asked Sergio about it. Sergio was the one who told me. Somebody actually misinformed me and told me they buried the chairs into the soft ground, and that's what I thought. And then Sergio said, no, no, those are my dad's chairs. He cut the legs off. And I said, why did he cut the legs off? And he, didn't, he said he'd get back to me on that. They break off anyway. They break off. <laughs> Do they? Anyway. And yeah. so Pardon me? Well, I, I, well, some of them, they're all painted differently. Some of my paintings, I hire models and I do them in interiors. I'll, exp I'll explain that. Sometimes I just go out in the fields and I take pictures. And it's very risky. I mean, the, uh, they eventually kick me off. And then I think, I think, gee, I got to go another three feet forward. You know, it's like I got to go a little farther. And eventually somebody comes up and tells me to go away. And uh, the funniest story was one, there was this one man out there that was about six foot three, 350 pounds. And he looked at me and he said, you, get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> and I slowly just started walking the other way and I think he must have figured out. But uh, 
eventually I'm, I, I, I haven't done it yet, but eventually I might get in contact with the farmers and I, you know, I know Sergio and I can talk to him and, you know, make an arrangement to have, you know, to go out there on a more official capacity. But there, I think it's, it's fun to just go out there and even though I know I'm going to get kicked off eventually, I, I just go out there and take these pictures. The containers they're carrying there are when they're planting seeds. Uh, you know, the strawberries are paid by the, um, by, the, by the strawberry, by the bunches, but with the lettuce, they're paid by the hour. So I, all these different things I never knew, and I started to learn, and it makes it, you know, it's making for a more richer experience and um, helping me understand and to define what I'm doing more. Um, but again, I really was not trying to be that specific about the subject matter. I mean, anybody can paint the field worker. Just get up and go out there and paint it. So I don't really feel that that in itself is that important. Okay, this is, it's almost over, by the way. But this is, um, I was driving down 101 and I saw this lady wrapping onions. And it was just, she was just sitting there all by herself wrapping onions. And I pulled my car over and took pictures. Uh, when I got back home, I didn't like the pictures. So I hired a model and I put it at dusk. And that's a model that I hired. And it's got a whole more surreal type of look. Uh, sort of, this is the same subject, vertical, made it horizontal. Uh, this is off of um, uh, end of day. You, you recognize it. It's Highway 1. Uh, where is that? Off of uh, Moss Landing. Moss Landing, yeah. Again, obviously very near Moss Landing. <laughs> if you saw this original, um, actually it was, many of you have seen this original. You know, there's a lot more paint quality in terms of the thickness of paint um, that you can't really see. It's all gone in this slide. This is 20 by 30, by the way. These are... Um, this was about 20 by 23, but I also did this much larger, 43 by 42 or something. Um, I took the composition from a painting by Millet, and I was very happy with this painting. But when I brought it into the gallery, it suddenly dawned on me, like, who's going to buy this painting of this old man pouring water into a ditch? And I thought, oh boy, what did I do? And because um, you can't escape those things, you know, when you've got to pay the bills. And, but fortunately, somebody actually bought this painting. And the nice story was the person didn't buy it immediately. Uh, they went to, this couple went down to, went through all the galleries in Carmel and decided that this was the painting they want and they came back and bought it. So I was very happy that, just because it's just not something you'd think, you know, like the painting Aisha. I can't imagine that painting of Aisha would be hanging in any gallery in Carmel. I just don't think they'd take it. I just, just think they wouldn't think it would sell. Um, now this is a little more pal palatable. Um, I, the, the, this is a combination of being, taking pictures in the fields and this was a woman who worked at the local uh, Mexican restaurant who I talked into posing for me. And so I, then I put her out there in the fields and not sure if it's that convincing. Uh, this is last two paintings. This is just sort of step by step. It was also in the American Artist magazine. Uh, I start off by doing a thumbnail sketch. Now, sometimes I do a thumbnail sketch without any, taking any photographs. But in this case, I had taken some photographs and then putting those photographs together, I did this sketch. You know, one from, you know, picking different, several photographs together. Um, I did a little color study. This is like nine by 12. Um, and then that's when I do the underpainting. I was talking about doing the grisaille underpainting. Doing any larger painting, I'd do a, a thorough underpainting in raw umber. And so pretty much work out the composition values, pretty much like a dress rehearsal. And it just, it, even though it takes a long time to do this underpainting in terms of drawing and everything else, it really pays off because the finished painting ends up being going much more rapidly. And a lot of this underpainting ends up being part of the finished painting. The raw umber helps to unify the color so the color is that it's a common color, a shared color amongst all the colors, this sort of raw umber. So it's, it's very useful. And, and, you know, nine out of ten old masters use this. You know, the Impressionists are the ones that threw this technique out the window. 
and then the finished painting. Some of you have seen this original. And then the last painting, um, I was wanted to do this painting, which is by Millet of uh, field workers at rest, or harvesters resting, I believe. Power, powerful painting. Um, <clears throat> so I couldn't figure out how to do this painting. I was thinking, should I like, you know, get permission from a farmer and hire like a dozen field workers, like, and do like a big film type of photo shoot? I couldn't figure out how to do it. And then finally, I ran across this scene in real life, where some field workers were resting on the side of the road, and I took pictures, but they really didn't work. Uh, even though I had them, but they were, I used it to help know what the poses were, and I was able to pose the models, and I got my students. So all those figures in the front are all my, are students of mine, I hired a model. The janitor was Hispanic, so I said, hey, come on in, why don't you pose? <laughs> I asked him, how much do you make an hour? And he, I said, I was gonna pay him, you know, 20 an hour, and he said, oh, that's more than I get paid as a janitor. So he came in and, and he posed, and, uh, and I did take some pictures that I had of uh, field workers, um, you know, and I spliced them into the scene. And the, um, the landscape was taken from, uh, it's off Davis Road in Salinas. I don't know if you're any familiar with that. So you see the original, it's 31 by 48, it's in the back. And uh, that's it. Okay. So, so. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much.